Terry. Yo no hi, John. Yeah, hi. Uh, Samantha, do I need to send you the uh, PowerPoint or I'm just going to share my screen? Uh, you can send me your PowerPoint. You I don't know if I can, if you have to allow me or not. I, I don't think I can. Um, Muy buenos días. Recordando a todos que en unos minutos vamos a iniciar la, la presentación. Recuerden que debajo ustedes tienen eh, un globito que dice interpretación. Dependiendo de su preferencia, ustedes van a poder escuchar el canal de su preferencia, ya sea en español o en inglés. Eh, va a haber interpretación simultánea. En unos minutos más, iniciamos. So welcome everyone. We are testing now the, the English channel and the Spanish translation. So if you are already connected to the Spanish uh, session, you are going to uh, hear these words in Spanish. Muy buenos días. Pues aquí simplemente probando para ver si funciona la Good traducción. morning. Just to make certain the audio channels are working. If you want to follow the English or rather first the Spanish translation, select the Spanish channel. Muy buenos días para recordarles a todos que en la pantalla, en el Zoom, hasta abajo... Just to remind you that there is an icon that says interpretation. If you click there, you will be able to find and switch channels. You will be able to find the um, translation into Spanish. The original audio will be broadcasted in the in the floor channel, not the English channel. He, uh, the presenter made a mistake. The English channel is for the English translation, not the original audio. Starting in three minutes. So welcome everyone to this conference held by John Pelletieri from the Queens College City University in New York City uh, with the title Emotional Intelligence in Education During the Coronavirus Pandemic. Bienvenidos a todos a esta conferencia impartida por el Dr. John Pelletieri. Welcome everyone to this conference from the Queen College City University of New York by John Pelletieri. 
the title is Emotional Intelligence in Education During the Coronavirus Pandemic. We remind everyone that there is simultaneous interpretation available for you, where you'll find the icon of the world interpretation there. You can select the language you need to listen to, either English or Spanish. We thank your attendance on behalf of the Education Department of the Ibero-American University and the National Confederation of Private Schools. We welcome everyone and we will begin in one more minute. Um, welcome. We're seeing you by camera. Okay, great. It's good to be here. Nice to good. nice to see you, John. Thank you for having me. Uh, Can you see my screen? I don't know if you want to to start the the seminar, the conference. Uh, I'm ready. Can, can you see the screen? Yes. You can. Okay, great. So I'll just kind of put us to the side here. So thank you everyone for being here uh, on this day in order to have this conference about emotional intelligence in education during the coronavirus pandemic. It's for us, the Universidad Iberoamericana and the Confederación Nacional de Escuelas Particulares, a real pleasure to have with us John Pelletieri, who is a great friend of us, of la, the Dr. Simena Chao, myself, Luis Medina. So thank you very much for the time, John. I think that you might have a, a really tough time there in New York with all the, the things about the pandemic. So we really do appreciate the time that you are spending. Uh, so it is very precious uh, for a person with your trajectory to be able to share uh, some time and some knowledge about uh, emotional intelligence during the pandemic. 
So thank you very much, and well, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, to you, uh, Dr. Medina, and to Dr. Chow, once again, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to work with the uh, people at uh, Ibero University and in Mexico. Um, I will be presenting on emotional intelligence and education in this current time of the pandemic. Now, the, you see here, this is my city, this is New York, that's Times Square. And um, normally it's very busy and crowded and there's thousands of people, but as you can see from the pandemic, uh, it is practically empty. So uh, quite a shift, this pandemic has had a tremendous impact globally and we're all feeling it. We're all experiencing it as we go through it. So emotional intelligence is certainly a, a very important area that we need to focus on now because it helps us not only with dealing with our students as educators, but dealing with our schools, our lives, our families, our society, our cities, in dealing with everything. Emotional intelligence is very, very important at this time. So you hear the, see the image of my city, New York City, and this is Mexico City. I was very fortunate in the last uh, couple of years to visit Mexico City uh, and present with Dr. Chow and Dr. Medina. And but again, uh, when I uh, was visiting the uh, cathedral here, it had many, many, many people. So again, a sign of what we're all going through now and how different the world is. And like anything, this brings up a lot of emotions. And so, we're going to look at how emotional intelligence can help us. I don't need to spend much time on this. I think you, you've all, uh, you know, are, are living this, experiencing this, you know, the disruption to our lifestyle, disruption to our work routines, de trabajo. a restriction on freedom and social activities. I mean, we just can't live the way we would normally uh, want to live and do what we want to do. There's uh, tremendous restrictions fear and anxiety about getting the infection, about getting illness, about dying, or other people dying, or going to the hospital. So you know, certainly tremendous fear and anxiety. These are very understandable emotions throughout uh, uh, these days. And also sadness and grief about loss. Uh, if we've lost people uh, through death or illness, uh, or if we've lost our jobs, things like that, or we lose social contact or connection. So a whole range of things to feel sad about that are related to loss. And I can even add here even anger that can be part of this and uh, loneliness and disappointment. There's a whole range of emotions uh, at the current time in the pandemic. And the effects of this pandemic, well, again, we are all well familiar with this. Uh, with regard to education, we have this huge challenge now of homeschooling uh, the kids while the parents are also working at home. So there are situations where parents have to deal with their jobs and they have to help their kids and the teachers are doing the best they can, but remotely it's much more of a challenge. Uh, another effect is that with the home environment, you might have several kids home at once when they would all be in school. You might have several young children at once. So that's a big challenge in the home environment. And then beyond that, uh, unemployment issues could be very serious, uh, uh, tremendous economic crises, basic unmet needs, uh, like, like food, for some people is a problem, uh, dealing with illness. If any of your students have a family member who's ill, that adds a tremendous layer of stress upon the home environment. And in addition to all these additional challenges and stress and problems, we now have reduced social contact. We have less support. So it's, a, it's an unmanageable balance in some cases. Now, let's look at directly on education, right? I know it's affected us across the board, but more specifically, as many of you are educators, what is the effect of the pandemic on education? Now, an article in the Harvard Gazette that came out in April, was interviewing uh, Paul Reville, who was the Secretary of Education for the state of Massachusetts in the United States. And a quote from that article saying, we have to strike a balance between what children need and what families can do. 
and how you maintain some kind of work-life balance in the home environment. Now, she's saying a lot in that statement, okay, a balance between what children need. Now, as educators, you know what children need. You know their learning styles, you know their capacities. You know what they need, but then what can families do? Well, that varies. Some families are much more involved, much more engaged. They have many more resources. Uh, so they could give, they could do a lot for the children. Other families may not be able to do as much. Uh, families may be stretched uh, to their own limits. So what the children need is one thing, but what the families can do is a different thing. And how do we get a balance of that? Not all the children's needs are going to be met. And that's an unfortunate uh, reality of the current pandemic crisis. And what families can do, well, they, we have to assess that. What can they do? What are they willing to do? And along with this balance between children and families, how do we maintain a work-life balance? And this applies to the families of your students, but also it applies to you. You as the teachers have your own families, your own children. So how do you as educators manage work-life balance when teaching from home? So this idea of balance, I think, is, is an important uh, metaphor to use, an important idea. The particular effects on students. Well, students have to work independently, but yet they have less support at home. They have more distractions at home. So it's much harder to do that. You know, so again, and some students have the capacity to work independently and others uh, are, are less so. One thing I've noticed uh, throughout with this pandemic that pre-existing problems are increased. And this applies to learning problems, it also applies to mental health problems, it applies to social problems, economic disparities. On all levels, any pre-existing problems in society are now exacerbated, are now increased. And as educators, we understand, yes, the, the, the learning problems that kids had before the pandemic are only going to be more difficult now because of the increased demands to work from home, to work online, and if the lack of support or less of less support and more distractions and disruptions. Other effects on students could have to do with technology. You know, not every kid has the same access to uh, technology, and that could be a, a very real concrete barrier. To, to continuing their learning processes. And along with that, parents taking on teaching roles at home, like I mentioned before. Uh, again, and parents may be very involved and engaged. If the parents themselves are teachers, that's a big plus for kids, but many parents cannot do that. They don't know how to teach. Uh, I would say one good thing that has come out of the um, pandemic is that I think any parents who are teaching their kids at home have a deeper appreciation for what teachers do in the classroom. Uh, I don't know if teachers are as well respected as they need to be. I know in the United States, they're not as well respected. And, um, you know, they do a hard job. They, 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 they do a lot to help kids. And I think parents now appreciate that more having uh, to go through this themselves at home. Okay, but tremendous effects on the students throughout. And these are only a few, obviously as educators, you, you understand these uh, very well. And like I mentioned before, we have to consider the effects on you as teachers. You had to very quickly adapt to online formats. You had to design new learning strategies and new uh, interventions. So it was a very quick uh, uh, adjustment. And that's also another aspect of this pandemic that it happened so quickly and so subtly it transformed society within a matter of weeks and months. So within this, teachers are balancing their work and family roles as well. Okay, so through all, all this, there's a lot of stress on teachers and students and families. Uh, the emotional impact is tremendous. And since we're talking about emotional intelligence, let's look a little more closely at some of the specific emotions that students may be feeling. Well, if there's technology problems, if there's challenges with learning independently, uh, they're gonna feel a lot of frustration and maybe discouragement. Okay, it's very hard. Now, let's, let's try to understand. Emotional intelligence is about understanding emotion. So frustration comes from having a goal that is blocked. So the kids may want to learn and they're struggling. They can't get it. Or they may want to get online and they're having technology problems. So that can be very frustrating for a lot of kids. 
So that's an emotion that as a teacher, you want to try to be sensitive to what the kids might be feeling. Other emotions could be hopelessness or discouragement. Kids get to a point where they may uh, disengage from learning. I have a colleague in New York. Uh, she teaches eighth grade children in the New York City public school system. And uh, she was saying those kids are disengaged. They just gave up. They just, that's it. So it's very, very hard to teach them. So those feelings of hopelessness and discouragement are certainly barriers to learning and indicators that uh, they have are disengaged from the learning process. Okay. Other emotional impact could be the uh, stress and anxiety and anger. Uh, students are feeling frustrated and this builds up. Parents may be getting frustrated. So anger and anxiety for sure are, could be very intense emotions that get in the way of the learning process for the students and affect their engagement in the learning process. And beyond education, in the broader scale, economic crisis is affecting everybody. Uh, many students have fears for working, they may have you know, not enough food. There's a real serious economic crisis around this. And then any death in the families related to the COVID-19 crisis. So I would even say that there certainly could be cases of clinical depression and maybe even trauma in some cases. And these are things, again, building on top of the pre-existing problems that uh, students may have had before the crisis. So the emotional impact is tremendous. It is extreme and it's pervasive. It's uh, across all aspects of society, affecting everybody. And as I was saying, it's not just a public health crisis, is an educational and a mental health crisis. So you as teachers, your, your role is to teach the students, but when there are mental health issues and depression and stress and anxiety, uh, you, you're doing much more than just the educational piece of their lives. You need to be sensitive and attuned to what they are going through and try to deal with that stress. Emotional stress is at the center of all of this. Now, I mentioned before the idea of balance. Well, let's look at this, you know, what is stress? Stress occurs when the demands outweigh the resources. So I like this metaphor of the rocks here. So the, the COVID crisis has put more demands on everyone with, but they have to be at home now, they can't go out, they have to learn online. Uh, parents are home with them, siblings are home with them. There's many more demands on them. They don't have the teacher support. They, they may not know what to do uh, in, in individual learning. But there's also the other side that the resources are less. Again, they're not in the classroom with you, the teachers, uh, to be able to work on, on things. You cannot guide them directly in the same way when they're not there. They don't have the social support of their friends. They don't have the structure of the classroom. So there's many things that are, are here. There are more demands and fewer resources which is tipping this balance in, in the negative direction and creating stress. Stress is when uh, our resources cannot match the challenge or the demands. So how do we now get to this level? How do we create some type of balance in some way? Well, if we're looking at that back and forth, we have to either reduce the, well, either increase the resources is one thing, so give them more support in some way. And since we're talking about emotional intelligence, how can you give the students an emotional support, emotional resources? That is something to think about in working with your students in the classroom, or in the classroom, through, through, through the internet uh, in, in learning process. How can you build emotional resources for students? How can you get them to feel in ways that will be helpful and adaptive ways that will help them to be more engaged in the learning process since we're not in the classroom. Another way to create balance is to reduce the demands. Now we can't change the problems throughout society, but what can we do at the educational end? Can we give less work or modified work? Can we adjust the curriculum, which I'm sure many of you have already done, but how can we get the demands of, of education and learning to be able to fit what the students are able to do. And it's that balance between the demands and the resources that 
brings things closer to the center here rather than imbalanced. And a third strategy to create balance is to have a manageable structure for coping. So if I kind of like this picture here. If you look at it, uh, we have, you know, there were the three rocks that were putting things down. Now look here, you, you still have three rocks on this side and one bigger rock on this side. So if we're going to go with this visual metaphor a little more, uh, the, the, the rocks that are weighing things down, the three rocks are actually balanced in a different way. They're spread out. They're not all on one on top of each other. Can you spread out the demands? Can you spread out the pressure so it's not all focused in one spot? And then on the balance side, can you increase that strength, the emotional resiliency that we're talking about, the emotional support? Can you increase students' capacity to uh, balance things out? We probably will not get to a perfect balance. That's unrealistic to expect that. But can we make things less unbalanced? That's the question we have to ask. And that's the important part of, of how we could use emotional intelligence to try to bring about better balance for our students. So using emotional intelligence. Well, first, let me start with a brief definition. There are more elaborate definitions in emotional intelligence. But I like this brief definition, and I like the three parts of it. So one, emotional intelligence is a set of abilities for using emotions, emotional information, in adaptive ways. And I'll repeat that. It's a set of abilities for using emotional information in adaptive ways. Now, abilities have to do with skills, what we can do, our capacity to do certain things. Emotional information is interesting, this idea that we use emotions as information. And I'll get a little deeper into that uh, uh, later in the presentation. When you see your students experiencing certain emotions, that tells you something. That's information for you, the teachers. But this student may not be able to be engaged right now because she's very sad or depressed or that boy is very frustrated or angry. And those emotions are giving you information that they may not be able to engage in uh, the learning situation at this moment. And the third part of this definition is that emotional intelligence is adaptive. And adaptive is another word for intelligence. When you could adapt to a situation, you're exercising some type of intelligence. So how do we put all this together in understanding and using emotional information. I'm glad I actually found the Spanish version of the mood meter. So you can see this here. And this is a good tool that we use in the emotional intelligence field for teaching. It's something you as teachers can use with your students for online learning as well as for the classroom when we eventually go back to the classroom. I'll go through the different parts of it. There are four quadrants. And the left side are the unpleasant or negative emotions. And the right side are the pleasant and positive emotions. And then you, so that's the, the unpleasant here and the pleasant here on the two sides. And then you can see the, uh, the high emotions are high energy and the low emotions are low energy. So any emotion can be mapped on this a graph here on, on, on this mood meter. It's whether pleasant or unpleasant or high or low energy. And this is a good tool, again, to, for us to learn about emotions and also to teach our students. And here we talk about uh, going back to this emotional information. So here, the unpleasant emotions, the red and blue, mean there's some type of imbalance there's some type of disequilibrium. There's something that's not right. There's something is off. If someone is angry, there's uh, an injustice going on. If someone is sad, there is a loss. If someone's afraid, there is um, a threat. So anything on the left side, the red and blue are the unbalanced uh, or disequilibrium. By contrast, in the right side, the pleasant emotions, yellow and green, signifies some type of balance. So if someone is happy or joyful in the yellow zone, 
If they're calm or relaxed in the green zone, there's not a threat, there's not a problem, things are balanced. In a general sense, when you could map a student's emotions on one level here, on one of these quadrants, they're either doing okay, there's a balance here, I can work with them a certain way if they're in the yellow or green zone, I'll work with them a different way when they're in the blue or red zone. So that's very important, just as a general assessment of your students when you work with them. Now, another way to look at the mood meter is this idea of the high and low quadrants, like I said before. So when they're, if they're angry or fearful in the red zone, or if they're happy or joyful in the yellow zone, there's more energy. They're going to act. They're going to take action, as opposed to the low energy, uh, the green or the blue, where there's, there's less likely to act. Right? So, you know, we've talked about emotions throughout human history, that emotions are adaptive. Right? Our, our primitive humans were able to react with fear when there was a threat. If there was a, a dangerous animal that could hurt them, they would feel fear. And they would run very fast, faster than they ever could run before. So the emotion of fear fuels that action. It helps them to, to act in a more effective, adaptive way. It's certainly intelligent and adaptive to run away from a very dangerous animal. Okay? Uh, as opposed to when someone is sad, well, there's low energy, so they may be more quiet, reflective. They stay inside themselves. They, they don't do that much when they're feeling sadness because sadness has less energy and low energy. Okay, so I, I think the mood meter is a very useful tool uh, on many levels, and we could practice a lot of the abilities here. We could recognize emotions with the mood meter because we could say, what am I feeling? And then where would that feeling go? You know, where would it be in that uh, quadrant? So that is a, a very important skill, the ability to recognize emotions or be attentive to your own emotions. That's one skill. Another skill is the idea of emotional knowledge. You know, what do we understand about emotions? All right, so if someone is feeling uh, low energy and pleasant emotion, they're in the green zone, that person's calm, they're relaxed. Okay, so I know there's not a problem, they're not in any conflict if they're very relaxed or calm, but they don't have a lot of energy. So maybe they don't want to do something up in the yellow zone. They don't want to do a very active thing, which requires more energy. They're kind of calm or relaxed. Maybe I'll just talk with the students then. I'll maintain that calm mood with them if this is where I, I, I believe they are. And then maybe we'll gradually move ourselves up to the, to the yellow zone with a, with a different kind of activity. You know, when I teach my university courses online, I will spend the first five or ten minutes talking to the students. How are you feeling? What are you doing? What's happening? I engage with the students. I try to see their, their moods. And I've had some classes, they're just very low energy, but more in the blue zone, more just sad or, or disconnected or, or even depressed. So there's, um, you know, the, the, there's that emotional tone in the group that I'm trying to assess. And then maybe I'll talk a little more with them when I feel they need some support before we get into the actual lessons. So I try to do an assessment and, and see where they're at. And from, from their mood, the mood of the group here, I will make a determination of how I proceed with my online classes for my university students. Now, another way we can use the mood meter is with emotional planning and emotional regulation. So first we recognize the emotion, second we understand the emotion, what it means, and now the third one, where in the mood meter do you want your students to be? Where do we want them to be? Now, research in emotions and brain functions has shown that when students are in a positive mood, that would be in the yellow zone, pleasant and high energy, they're more engaged, they're more active, their brain processes information more efficiently. Uh, they are more creative, more open. So probably here is one of the best places for learning, not even so high. If you're very, very high in the yellow zone, like a plus five, you want to have a party, a fiesta, you want to dance, you want to you have a great time. You don't really want to sit down and do schoolwork if you, your energy is too high. But a pleasant mood is low, maybe a one or a two. This part of the mood meter is a great place for learning. And we've shown that. When kids are in a negative mood, they don't learn as well. If they're irritable or if they're sad, 
or annoyed. They do not learn as well. The brain does not process information as effectively when they are in the uh, negative uh, uh, quadrants. But the yellow quadrant, higher, uh, moderate energy is the best place to learn. Okay, now, you know, depending on the activity, where do you want your students to be? Okay, you might want them to be more serious. Okay, so maybe even closer to the middle here. Not necessarily an opposite mood, but not so cheerful if they've got to work on specific things. Okay, they, you know, they're more serious, they can be more attentive. So we're going to be in different moods throughout the day, and each mood is a good match for a particular kind of task. Okay, if you wanted to fight against social injustice, and if you were going to have a protest, well then you'd be in the red zone. You'd want to be angry and, and fighting for justice here. You don't want to be calm and relaxed if you're going to go for a big protest. Okay, if you want to be focused uh, and, and determined to, to work and, and change the injustice in society. Uh, and if you, want to, if you want to learn something, then again, the positive is the best place to be. So that's emotional planning. Now, how do we get there? And that's a big question. How do you facilitate the student's moods to get to where you want them to be? And this is a big challenge. It's a very big challenge. How do we get them? If, if they're irritable or annoyed, they'll be in the red zone. If they're sad or depressed, they'll be in the blue zone. Or if they're just relaxed or calm, they'll, they'll be in the green zone. But we probably want them to be really around here, to, to be most attentive, to optimize learning. So in this way, um, we have to change their emotion. We have to change the intensity of emotions, and we have to change the emotion itself. Now, one thing that I find is useful to think about when, when you look at the five to the one and the one to the five, the closer to the middle of the mood meter, that line across the, uh, the horizon, the closer to the middle, the easier it is to change. Those are less intense emotions. So if a student is really, really angry and upset, you can't just suddenly turn them over to be happy or suddenly be calm. If they're really angry and upset, you Or maybe bring that annoyance down to a two or a one. So the first strategy in, in, in emotion is changing the intensity of the emotion. That comes first. Bring the intensity down as, as low as possible, because then if someone goes from really, really angry to only, well, I'm still a little bit angry and annoyed, but I can listen to you. When they're really angry, they're probably not listening to you, or they're not processing information accurately. But when they are mildly angry or annoyed, it's more likely they could hear you. And then from this face, then you can move that emotion over. You can maybe try to understand them, show empathy, show listening to them, uh, help them to feel understood, have their feelings validated, do some supportive work with the students. So then that mood could shift and they can maybe engage in the class activity and be more uh, in a more pleasant mood easier said than done okay it's easy to talk about it to actually do it in the real classroom is hard and to do it online is even harder okay but just the idea that we could use the mood meter ourselves to to map out the students emotions and plan where and how we'll get them to different places in in the mood meter we also could use this ourselves this is also an important tool for our own self-awareness tune into yourselves there's actually a mood meter app you can get it online and it's called the Mood Meter app. It's, it's from the Yale University uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence. Uh, Mark Bracker, I think his name is down here. Mark Bracker is the one who uh, designed the Mood Meter and coined the term Mood Meter. And they pu publish it through the Yale Center. And it's a really cool, you could tune into it. And I, when I used it about a year or two ago, I uh, had the, my alarm on my cell phone set maybe four times a day. And it would remind me, and I'd say, what am I feeling right now? I would tune into that feeling. And so um, I found it very helpful. And then you can keep track of what your moods are throughout the day or throughout the week. And so it's a good little tool to use if you want to in the electronic, in the digital world here. You could use a mood meter app. So there's a lot of ways to use it. You could be creative with it, but it's a good tool to introducing emotions and focusing on emotions and teaching about emotions. Now, 
working with emotions can be a creative process. And as you may know, I like creativity, I like art, I like metaphors, so I like to bring this metaphor that the teacher is the artist and the students and their emotions are the colors for the painting. So you're given a palette here, you have these colors. What kind of painting can you create with the colors that you have? Right? What kind of painting, what kind of artwork can you create given the materials you have here? You may not have much. Students may be really low in energy, in an unpleasant mood. There may not be much to work with with your students. That's what you got to work with though. So what can you do as a creative artist to make what you can make? Now I know an artist and they said they did everything they could. They, they didn't have money for a canvas, so they used like a curtains from a window or shades, or they found anything. They found people, some artists find garbage and they make it into a beautiful work of art. So the artistic process can be very amazing and fascinating. And as teachers, you are artists. Regardless of what topic you're teaching, you are an artist in how you could work with the children. And what do they give you? What is the colors for that day? And what could I make with that day? I'll do the best I can to make what I can make with, that, with what I have. And another day, I'll have a different set of colors from the students. Now, I like to present what I call the art model of emotional intelligence. It's a way of organizing three processes that I find very useful. So one is this idea of attention. R is for regulation and T is for transform. And I know the Spanish word for, for art is A-R-T-E. So we could maybe add educate if we're using the Spanish word as an acronym. But in English, it's, it's A-R-T. And so A stands for attention, attention to emotions. We want to recognize and understand feelings. And we talked about that earlier. Tune in, what am I feeling in my body? What is my breathing? What is my heart rate? What am I experiencing in, in, in my own emotional state? And for students, what are the students experiencing? What does their face tell me? What is their body language, their tone of voice? All these elements are, are what we use to recognize emotions, to pay attention to emotion. And emotions are important. Regardless of what you're doing in education, the students' emotions play a role. That's been well established in research. So uh, we need to focus on attention first. Now, once we recognize and understand what the students are feeling, now the next part is regulate. We have to accept the emotions and manage the intensity of the feelings. Like I said before, if a student is, has a very high intensity, they may not be able to concentrate on schoolwork. Okay, so we need to change their emotion. If a student is very uh, uh, relaxed or calm, they need to bring up their intensity. Okay, it's ple a pleasant feeling to be relaxed, but if we have to do work, we have to be a little more serious, a little more focused. We need more energy to do work. So in that regard, we have to try to increase the energy level for a kid who's very calm or who's very sad in the blue or green zones. Okay, so that's the idea of regulate. And then the T stands for transform. How can we transform emotions? How can we change them into something useful? And that's a much more creative and difficult process. They could be ineffective emotions, and how can we change them to more adaptive emotions? So when I mean ineffective, it's not that the emotion is bad or inappropriate, but it may not be conducive to learning. If a student is just very uh, disappointed or discouraged or disengaged, they're not going to learn. Those emotions are ineffective for learning. Maybe they're effective for something else, but they're not effective for learning. So how can we transform that? How can we bring a balance back to uh, the student's emotional state in a way to get them in a state of mind where they're able to be more engaged in the learning process? So. These are some of the strategies. Let's look at some of the skills that we do for using the art model. So we wanna draw attention to feelings. So first we would notice the facial expression, the body language, the tone of voice. Those are nonverbal cues that we need to pick up on if we're going to recognize a, a student's emotions. Now, if we were doing this workshop in a classroom face to face, I would say, what is this little girl feeling? You look at her face, 
Right? If you look at her body posture, she's leaning against a swing. Right? She's there all by herself. What does this tell us? Right? We want to notice the emotions. We want to read the emotion. Paying attention is, is the first step here. Something else we could do, sometimes we can ask the students how they feel. That's a, that's a good strategy. It doesn't always work. They may not know how they feel, or they may not want to share feelings. But we can always ask students, how are you feeling? Okay. Um, we may want to talk about the difficult feelings of being in quarantine, being stuck at home, missing their friends. If we're doing an online class, I think it's useful to do that. I, as I said, for my university students, I will spend the first five or 10 minutes talking about what they're doing, how they're feeling, uh, you know, what's happening. I know it's, it's not necessarily a lot happening, but, but what are they doing? How are they managing? It's a little bit like a group therapy. I'll say, you know, how are you coping with being uh, uh, stuck at home? And, uh, you know, maybe that could, they, what they share could give some ideas to their colleagues, to their friends. So I get into a conversation, talking about it, emotions and the difficulties of the uh, pandemic is very important to do so. It helps them to process it, helps them to be heard, helps them to feel recognized and understood. Okay, so I think that's, and that's all part of paying attention to emotions. Okay, so that's the first step here. Next uh, is of the art model is regulate. We want to, how do we regulate emotions? Well, first we want to give permission to stay with the negative feelings. Give permission. It's okay to feel discouraged or frustrated or lonely or angry or annoyed. It's okay to feel that way. And that's a very important message to give. A lot of times unpleasant emotions or negative emotions are judged as, as being uh, you know, bad or not good. No, we, we want to give permission. It's okay to feel that way. A whole range of emotions have been brought up by the disruptions in society from this pandemic. There's a whole range of unpleasant emotions, and it's, it's natural to feel that. So we want to give permission to that. And along with that, we want to practice accepting unpleasant emotions. Again, this is the way the situation is. It's not a, it's not a good time. Okay? The pandemic has been disrupted on so many levels. We're all feeling it. So practice accept. Yes, I accept that this is how things are. I don't feel happy right now, or I feel frustrated, or I feel uh, discouraged. That's how I feel. I accept that. By accepting it, we're not fighting it. And that allows the student to maybe move beyond that and to transform that emotion. It sets the stage. Acceptance and the permission to feel sets a stage for emotional transformation. Now, another thing we can do to help regulate emotions is empathy. When we could show empathy to our students and try to be attuned to what they're feeling. That could help reduce distress. They could feel understood. Okay, so empathy can be a very positive intervention that teachers can use. And then also shifting our perspective and thinking can change our feelings. Okay, so like uh, I even said before, well, what does it feel like to be stuck at home? Even if I use that word stuck, that wouldn't be a good word. When I think about that, I, I would change that word. What is it like to be home? Right? Being stuck has a negative tone to it and students could feel a more unpleasant feeling. And I have a, a, a colleague who's a psychologist and he, he, he'll ask his clients questions. Well, uh, when you're staying home, what does it feel like to be home protecting yourself from the virus? So now what we've done is we change the perspective. We're not stuck at home and trapped here and we're prisoners. No, we're home because it's a safe place. Home has protected us from the virus. So to reframe what home means that reframe, that new perspective, uh, allows us to, to feel differently about it. It causes us to think differently about uh, why we're home and the purpose of it. Okay, so these are all different ways, and there's many other strategies of, of how to regulate emotions, to stay with them, to accept them, to feel understood by others, and then maybe even shift the perspective and thinking to, which will alter our feelings. The third of part of the art model is transforming emotional states to change from ineffective emotions to more adaptive and intelligent emotions. And again, not that any emotions are bad, but that we want certain emotional states that are more conducive, more effective for learning. 
So one, we want to develop a positive connection. Again, a lot of research has shown that the teacher-student relationship <clears throat> is important, not just for developing emotional intelligence, but for learning in general. The teacher-student relationship is very, very important. So we want to create that connection or continue that connection that we've had with our students. We want to support them. We want to show encouragement and hope. If they feel connected to us, even through online, that connection can be important for them. It can help them get through this. They are less likely to feel discouraged or disengaged when they know their teachers care about them and their teachers want them to succeed and their teachers uh, you know, have a positive view of them and believe they can do it. That positive connection and that encouragement is very important from a teacher. It probably has more of an effect than you could realize. So that's a very important thing. Another uh, strategy for transformation is to generate positive emotions to balance the negative ones. An activity I've done with my students at the university in our online classes, I will show to everyone, think about something you appreciate. Something you appreciate, something going well in your life. And some of them would say, well, you know, by being quarantined at home, I actually get to spend more time with my family. And that's a nice thing. It's a positive thing. I actually have more time uh, to read or to do other things I like. Uh, some people are very creative. I had more time to listen to music. So, you know, they're, they're looking at finding something positive. Even if there's 10 negative things, uh, we could find only three positive things. Let's not forget those three positive things. All right, so generate positive emotions by focusing on what you appreciate, focusing on what you're grateful for, gratitude, uh, appreciation. These things are, uh, create a positive mood in the mind. Some people do a gratitude list. I know in psychotherapy, that's a strategy that's used. And for, for my counseling clients, I, I will sometimes do that. Make a list of things you're grateful for every day. It could be the same things, it could be new things. And just that five or 10 minutes of focusing on gratitude is really important. It creates a positive mood, even for that short time, and that changes your state of mind to have that positive mood. Another thing is engage students in a commitment to something interesting or meaningful. Okay, this idea of commitment, what can you do? There's a lot we can't do in the, in the current pandemic, but what can we do? What can help us to uh, you know, move forward and to, do, to be engaged in something interesting, meaningful? Like I said, people have taken up different hobbies or going back to doing things they enjoy or love. We have all this extra time at home. Let's try to spend time doing that. Right? Some people have started hobbies. Right? I get, uh, I'll get uh, text messages or emails from uh, friends or people I know who are, who are doing this kind of cooking or that kind of cooking. They're all doing different things. So they're engaging in something meaningful and interesting. And that kind of engagement ties a lot in with positive psychology. And it's a way to keep someone uh, motivated. It, it protects them. It's a buffer from being depressed or disengaged when you're actually doing something meaningful. And that idea of a commitment is important. So see if you could develop that with students. And the other strategy here is to emphasize students' power to choose and to take charge of their feelings. A lot of kids, and even some adults, they think that emotions just happen to you. They just happen. I have no control, I have no power of them. They just happen to me. And that's not true. Emotions are created. I said before that emotions are influenced by thinking. If we change the way we think, if we change our perspective of things, that could change the way we feel. Uh, we could also have a relationship with our own emotions. We tune into what, what am I feeling? What's going on with me right now? Now, many of you have probably done this. You have a stressful time at home or a stressful time traveling to work. And maybe, you know, before the pandemic, you would get to school and you'd be frustrated or annoyed. Well, you got to put that aside and then focus on your students to teach them in the class. And same thing here. If it's an online class, you could be uh, uh, frustrated or, or discouraged about something. You got to put that aside to be present for your students. That's a type of transformation. That's a type of regulation. You're taking charge of your feelings. I know I feel discouraged. I know I feel annoyed or irritated. I accept that. I'm going to manage this. I'm going to put it on the side for now. And I'm going to focus on what I got to do. It doesn't mean I'm ignoring the feelings. We don't want to ignore them. We don't want to uh, deny what we're feeling. 
but we can make a choice. I'm gonna to choose to put these emotions on the side for now, and I'll get back to those issues after my class. But right now I, I'm committing to be focused on my students. So you use a lot of these skills anyway. Naturally, as teachers, we, we use a lot of emotional intelligence abilities to begin with. It's important to understand them all in these models though, and to make conscious choices uh, to use emotional skills. So we've talked about paying attention to emotions, and then we've talked about trying to be with the emotion and regulate it and manage it, and then finally try to transform the emotion into a different form that's more adaptable for us or for whatever's needed at the moment. So now I, I laid out six or seven different strategies here, specific activities now that we could use in distant learning as teachers. You could use these today with your students or some variation of it. These are only suggestions and of course, in your own creativity, you'll come up with different variations, different ways of doing this. So one set of activities is having students engage in creative art. Uh, so they could draw a picture expressing their feelings. That might be very useful for them. They may have a lot of different feelings and if they're not processed, Drawing is a way of expressing, you know, art therapy, music therapy, those are all creative ways of expressing emotions. Uh, uh, writing stories about their experiences, again, something else they can do. A visual format with the paintings and a, and a verbal format with uh, the writing, it's a way of expressing their feelings. That can be therapeutic for kids. Not that you're therapists or counselors, but you can be therapeutic with your students and help them to manage their emotions and express their emotions in this way. Another art project could be making collage, cutting out images, or getting images from online and putting them together and making some type of collage. Again, a creative artwork. If, and I mentioned music, if kids are musicians, could they write a song? Could they make up a dance? Can they write a poetry? Can they do anything to, to express their emotions through art? That's a powerful tool. A powerful set of activities. Now as teachers you may have done a lot of art activities with students but now we're going to do them with the specific intention of helping students express their emotions. So I wouldn't just say simply go draw a picture. I would say draw a picture that expresses how you feel and, and then when they share it with you well let's talk about it. What images did you put in the picture? What colors did you use? What shapes or textures do you have? So what choices did you make to express those emotions? So it, 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 you know, rather than have it just as a simple art activity, do a painting, do it uh, uh, an art activity with a purpose, with an intention to express and to understand emotions. And obviously the last part, sharing the art with others in the group could be a powerful method. They, they can be proud of the work they did and other kids give feedback and they could all share something. It'd be a group activity, okay? So this is something to do, uh, uh, creative arts activities is one set of act, uh, uh, strategies for the classroom. Another set of activities could be the mood meter like we went over before. And uh, you could identify their emotions and increase emotional vocabulary. So first, what are you feeling? Is it pleasant? Well, if it's pleasant, it's on this side, on the right side. If it's unpleasant, it's on this side. We could just start with a simple question. Okay, now if it's high energy or low energy? Okay, well, if it's low energy, it's down here. If it's high energy up here. So even to put them in the quadrant, and I know when uh, they've used the mood meter in school programs, they would, kids get, could pick up the language here, say, well, I'm in the red zone, or I'm in the yellow zone, or I'm in the blue zone. So they say that that's where they're at. It's a general, a general categorization of their mood. But beyond that, they could increase emotional literacy. So where, you know, uh, what emotion specifically am I feeling in these quadrants? So use the mood meter as a tool for emotional vocabulary and emotional literacy. You could also use the emotional planning where they want to be in the mood meter. Well, you're feeling uh, you know, irritable not right now, but where do you want to be? Oh, you want to be in the yellow zone. Okay, so now how do we get there? You're feeling irritable. How can we get you into a, a, another mood? How can we change the irritation? Okay. You know, what can you do? Can you change the way you think about something? Can you do something? Can you take a break for five minutes and come back and then re-engage? You know, whatever. E each kid will require a different strategy for changing that mood. So that would be uh, uh, 
you know, using emotional planning uh, and discussing ways to change their mood. That's emotional regulation. So you could teach all four of the emotional abilities within the mood meter, okay? Another important uh, aspect of this, of this activity is convey a message that feelings are acceptable and useful. So when engaging in emotional learning activities, you wanna be sure to give that message. It's not bad to feel angry or sad or afraid. There's nothing wrong with that, it's just a feeling. It can be adaptive sometimes, but it may not be adaptive other times. We need to make that determination. Okay, so the mood meter itself is a good tool uh, for, for giving emotional uh, learning uh, lessons. Now the third strategy that teachers can use for the online learning is group discussions. Now, obviously in the picture, these kids are all together, that you wouldn't be doing that, but you can have an online discussion. I don't know if you use Zoom or Google Meet or some other format, have a discussion with kids. Discuss the pandemic. Be sure they have accurate information. That's supportive for them. Okay, identify which students have similar feelings. Who's feeling discouraged? Who's feeling lonely? Who's missing their friends? Who's afraid? Have them feel connected. The group discussions is a way of bringing kids together. Discuss coping methods that each student uses. I've done that with my uh, graduate students. You know, what are you doing to get through the pandemic? What's helping you uh, while we're, we're all staying home? And they could all talk about that and share that with the group. So the group discussion could give ideas to each other. And it's the idea finally of this group cohesion as a source of social support. So while it's an activity to do with students, there's also a deeper purpose that they're feeling connected. That idea of social connection is very important, especially now with the uh, social distancing, that they're not connected to their friends in the same way. So to build a meaningful engagement a meaningful discussion in the distant learning formats where the students can be connected and share with each other. That's a very powerful tool. And it can, if you have a big class, you can maybe arrange it to have smaller group conversations. There's different things you can do, but work with the group dynamics is a very important part of uh, the educational process. The fourth uh, strategy comes back from positive psychology, generate positive emotions but without denying negative ones. Okay, so these are some of these strategies I mentioned earlier. Write a list of gratitude or appreciation. So that's an activity you could do with the students uh, during the, uh, uh, the day, you know, during the class. You could assign it as, as something to do at home on their own. Make that list of gratitude and appreciation. It evokes a positive state of mind. Uh, discuss students' strengths and accomplishments. What are they good at? What do they feel good about? That also creates a positive state of mind. Okay, if we only focus on what is a problem and what we're losing and missing, we can get too stuck in the unpleasant emotions. So focus on what they have accomplished and what strengths they have. Recognize the opportunity within crisis. And this is something I've done with my students as well. A crisis is a problem, but there's always an opportunity within that crisis. So I've asked my students in the online classes, what's something you've learned from being home for the last month or two? What's something that you figured out? What's some insight you've had? There's always an opportunity to learn. And, and some have said, well, you know, I, I really appreciate being with my family. I spent more time with my family. And so that's something that's been helpful to them. And that's something I personally would share. I've had a lot more time with my family being home and I enjoy that very much. So going forward, I wanna make sure I spend more time with my family even after the pandemic is over. So that's something that I have personally learned uh, uh, in this crisis here. So look for that opportunity. And now that creates, that requires flexibility, that requires a, an open mind to see possibilities or opportunities within the crisis. And finally, well, the last thing, yeah, discuss what students have learned from the experience. And that's also, that's what I just said, that uh, there's opportunities for learning. Every life experience is an opportunity for learning. Even an unpleasant life experience is about learning. And as teachers, I hope that we all focus on lifelong learning, not simply learning what they need to do to pass the test or to pass the grade or the course or to graduate. It's not just about academic learning, it's about life learning. And in this uh, life crisis that we have around the planet, there's an opportunity for all of us to learn something uh, in general. So that, that 
kind of focus would be very helpful for students. And you could work that into the activities with them. The fifth uh, set of activities is really less of an activity, but to create a structure or a routine. Okay, predictability can reduce anxiety. So when kids know what to expect, okay, if there's a, an order and a structure to what you're going to do every day, that can be very helpful. Okay, it's predictable. Uh, another structure, like I said before, have a check-in at the beginning of class. Okay, five minutes at the very beginning and then five minutes at the end of class. Okay, check-in, it gives a structure, the beginning and end of the online class. Okay, organize routines and schedules. Okay, so have them plan out a schedule or you, you help plan a schedule, depending on the age, obviously, if you're working with elementary children versus high school children, that's going to be very different. Uh, so maybe you may need to make a schedule for them or they work with the parents to make a schedule with them or uh, they can make their own schedule. And to the extent possible, have the students contribute to the decisions. Well, what would you like to do? So what could you do between today and tomorrow? What's one thing that you believe you can do regarding homework or regarding something else? Okay, so have them be part of the decision making. Students are more motivated when they have the autonomy to make some decisions and to choose certain goals. So to the extent possible, let them choose particular goals and have them work towards that. Okay, I don't know if so this actually photo is from my own collection when I visited uh, La Casa Azul uh, uh, two years ago in Mexico City. That's the, the idea of structure of a building, create some type of structure. And the sixth one is to encourage social connection. Social distancing is not social isolation. Sharing with friends can be supportive. So one activity you could do as a teacher is set up a group project that requires social interaction. It requires them to spend time outside of class working online with each other to create something. That's a great strategy. It's a structure that you put in place and it facilitates social connection. And that's what kids need. They need connection. Uh, everyone needs, uh, but particularly the students. And then have regular contact with the students about their progress. Again, it depends on how many students you have and your way of working with them. But if you could have email or some type of you know, text uh, contact with them, uh, that could be a, a way to keep them connected to you. And that's a strategy that will help them to feel uh, more motivated, perhaps. OK, so that's the activity. Number six. And now the idea of teacher attitudes. Okay, so what can we as teachers, just a general attitude bring? So some of this I've covered already, but let's, co let's go over it now. Uh, the idea of flexibility. We as teachers have to be flexible. We as people have to be flexible. So the world is different. The, the pandemic has affected all facets of society. So we have to be flexible. Uh, flexible. So here, uh, you would need to adjust to the student's current capability. What can the students do? What can the families do? How much can the families support them, if at all? You have to adjust to that, okay? And part of that flexibility is letting go of less important tasks. And it's interesting, a lot of stress and conflict comes from not letting go. This has to get done, this is so important. And actually, well, it, it may not be that important. Maybe if we could let this go, we relieve ourselves of a lot of stress. Back to the idea of acceptance uh, of how things are, almost like a Zen Buddhist uh, attitude, just accept things as they are and, and let things go. So that, that all fits under flexibility, which is an important attitude for teachers. The next attitude I've, I've labeled determination or commitment. So while we can let go of some tasks, we do have to do other tasks. We can't let go of everything. Some tasks are necessary. Kids have to do certain things. So I'm determined as a teacher to make sure my students get the work done that, that cannot be let go, that they have to do. And so we may have to tolerate uncomfortable feelings in ourselves as teachers or tolerate the students' uncomfortable feelings. Okay, so they have to learn to tolerate, I don't really want to do this. Well, but we have to. It's important to do it. We're determined to do it. We're committed to learning. And that's the other part, it's the importance and value of, of learning Keep that in mind and try to instill that importance in the students' minds. It is important to do the, the homework. It is important to learn. You as a person are important. Your life is important. This is part of make, giving you a better life. 
So that kind of attitude is part of commitment to learning, to growing, to having the best life you can have and be the best person you can be. That attitude, when you feel that attitude, you'll convey it to at least some of your students, maybe not all of them, but some of them. The last one is the idea of positivity and hope. Stay positive, it's hard to. It's hard to stay positive all the time when things are so difficult, but we gotta try to find that positivity in ourselves. Okay, be optimistic. Things can get better, they hopefully will get better. Try to seek the potential, like I, I said before. What is a possibility? What are the opportunities for learning, even in an unpleasant crisis? So we wanna keep that openness, that positivity and hope. All these can contribute to the way we work with kids and in turn contributes to the way the students respond to our learning. And for you as teachers, it's the, it's the importance of self-care. You have to take care of yourselves. You'll be better teachers when you're in a better state of well-being. So that's very important. And that's just that teachers, all of us, all of us need to engage in uh, self-care. And that can include many things. One of them, practice the EI principles in ourselves and with our families. Okay, so you know, use the mood meter. I, I have the mood meter hanging up in my house, in my kitchen. So if anyone in my family, we could see it, it's right there. If you wanna say, I'm feeling in this mood, or I'm feeling in that mood. So we could use that in ourselves and with our families. And I don't say you have to hang the mood meter up, but just use those principles if you want. You know, pay attention to emotions, regulate your own emotions, try to transform what you're feeling into a different emotion if you need to. Practice those principles with yourself. Another part of self-care is devote time and activities to your own emotional and physical health. Engage in things that are meaningful to you. Uh, engage in things that are purposeful, that, that you enjoy, that bring, that bring pleasure, that bring positive feelings for you. Be engaged in that. Exercise, take care of yourself. You, know, you are important. Teaching is a difficult and stressful job at times. And being in the crisis of the pandemic is stressful for everyone. So don't forget to take care of your own health in all this. Practice acceptance and mindfulness. Again, accept how things are. Be mindful of your experiences. That connects to yoga and meditation. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to do that. I, I find it very helpful myself. I don't do it that often, but when I do it, I do find it very helpful. So that's something to, uh, to try to practice. Build it into your weekly routine. And finally, have a nutritious and healthy diet. You know, keep your body healthy. Keep your body uh, in shape. And that, in turn, will keep your mind in shape. And going with this, the idea of good food and good mood. Okay, so they line up here. The colors line up. You know, that's important. Good food, good mood. Okay. And, and I want to look at, I, I came across this. It was a... Uh, uh, sort of a comical set of uh, art. It's, it, it's classical art, but during the coronavirus, someone was very creative in putting words to that. So I'm going to show these arts of one or two on a page, and they were actually in Spanish, so it's easy for you just to read. But you might recognize some of the classical artworks and how they express what we've gone through in this coronavirus crisis here, in this in, in this uh, quarantine time and social distancing. Okay, and so I hope you enjoy the art display and the 
humor around the pandemic. I think we need a sense of humor to help get us through this. And so now I would like to uh, say thank you very much. I hope you all are safe and healthy. And I believe we're going to have a period of time now for questioning. Thank you, John. Thank you for this fantastic talk. It was really, really amazing. It really went to the point as to how we teachers can deal with this uh, distancing, not only for teaching and our students in learning, but us as people also involved and in living truly uh, throughout this pandemic. So thank you very much. Really my, my biggest appreciation to this contribution and this hearthy uh, knowledge that you gave us today. We do have some questions and some are, I think really important to address. So I'll start uh, recuperating questions that uh, okay. our participants have stated in the chat. If anyone wants to participate, we still have time, please place your questions on the Q&A uh, section of the uh, Zoom panel. So uh, John, we have a question dealing with how to deal with uh, violence in particular at home. It's not, oh. it's, not much, it's not so much dealing with students, but I think it's important. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take advantage of your knowledge in this field because I think okay. it might be happening in many homes. Right, right. How do we deal with violence at home in this uh, situation of confinement? That's a big issue, right? And, and, and like I said, uh, a lot of problems that pre-existed before the pandemic educational and, and social and mental health problems are amplified and made worse by the situation. And so certainly, yeah, there is an increase in domestic violence. That is something that's happening. Um, that's a difficult thing. Uh, here's a case, I believe if a student, uh, it's a question meant that if a student reaches out to you, that they're concerned about violence or you're suspecting something. I know that it depends on, I don't know exactly how the question is meant, but I mean, certainly people have to be involved. I didn't know about the social services in Mexico City and what they, how that situation, how the agency might operate. Um, understand behavior. If someone's acting out violently, this it's a tremendous anger and uh, it's uncontrolled. So let's look at it from an emotional intelligence point of view. There's anger, even rage, and it's not controlled. So we identify that emotion and, and the problem here is that it's not being controlled. So can we talk with the family? I mean, that's something that I don't know if the depends on the relationship the teacher may have with family members. Uh, depends on the age of the children. That's something else. Uh, but clearly the person acting out with violence is not managing emotions and regulating emotions. And that's a real crisis. And if the police have to be involved, unfortunately, that, that, that may be necessary or if a social service agency has to come. But if, if, if it could be resolved through talking, through communication, to encourage communication within the family, again, just how we use these different strategies to uh, try to help our students manage their emotions, the family could hopefully help that person acting out to manage their emotions. Thank you, John. Uh, we have another question regarding um, how to deal with the loss of uh, loved ones or friends or people in the community once we're back because we're certainly experiencing, I'm addressing the tough questions first, because I think <laughs> these, are, these are really, these are really, are. I, I, can, I can see that it's, uh, it, it's a deep uh, questioning, but I think it's this important. This is a tough time, a difficult, tough time in the world. So of course these questions are appropriate. How do we deal with, especially with the children, as we go back to the space where we used to meet at school and we find out that some of our loved ones, some of our peers, some of our friends are missing due to this pandemic? It's very sad. It's very tragic. Um, I think people need to be able to feel that. As unpleasant as that is, have an acceptance that this is the reality. We're all very sad. We miss our classmate or we miss that person or we miss that, child, that student's parent. We will miss them. And it's just very, very sad and tragic. Again, allow yourself to be with the feeling, to sit with it. Don't be overwhelmed by the feeling, but don't uh, ignore it either. 
sometimes when, when families or, or, or communities don't talk about feelings, then they stay stuffed inside the person and they never get resolved, they never get expressed. I had a psychotherapy client uh, who lost several coworkers in her job. She's an adult, a young adult. She lost uh, several coworkers and she was feeling very intensely, but because she had lost her mom like uh, six or seven years earlier. So she never fully resolved the grieving process of losing her mom. And that made the loss of her coworkers much more painful and difficult for her. So we talked about the importance of processing that. And processing grief is not easy. It takes a long time. But I think allowing students, when you do get back and, and you recognize the different losses, allowing them to process that, to, to sit with the feelings, to talk about it, to just be with people. I think when people are grieving, they need support. They need someone to be with them. And maybe some of the creative art activities can be a way of honoring someone they've lost or at least uh, recognizing their own feelings around that. So even the creative art uh, it could be a good strategy. Yeah, thank you, John. And then um, what can you give us an advice or strategy for uh, balancing, uh, emotional balancing and well-being balancing for, for parents who are right now being parents, but also teachers, but also attending to the whole domestic situation. You know, our roles have multiplied during this mm -hmm. pandemic. So mm -hmm. any, any advice, any strategies to cope with this? Uh, For the parents to balance their roles as teachers and as family members. Right, that's a big challenge that, for everyone, as we know. Um, it, it depends, I think, on how young the kids are. If you have young children you have to take care of, it's much more difficult. They require much more attention versus if you have older children, they require a different kind of attention. Uh, how do we use emotional intelligence around this? Well, again, um, the acceptance that everyone's got feelings and everyone has needs. Each student needs things to learn. Um, the parents need things. Parents are people too. And that could be a powerful message to, to teach the children. That, yeah, I also need to, I need to work right now. I can't be paying attention to you. Uh, but I need to help you at a different time. So that's a tough one. And that also depends on how, you know, the kind of balance the family may have had before the pandemic. But uh, I think a structure helps when there's an organized structure that certain hours in the day are meant for work, other hours in the day are meant for family, and we have to have this structure. And the challenge there is when other family members need something. So if a child needs attention, but, you know, a mom is working for two hours, that child might either need to get attention from another family member or learn to tolerate the frustration of not having attention until mom is finished teaching and then mom can pay attention to me. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity, again, like every experience is an opportunity for learning, an opportunity for, uh, for them to practice emotional regulation skills and learn about that to manage the balance. And not easy, easier said than done. It may never be a perfect balance, but we could always be try, trying all the time. And, and you have to readjust the balance on a daily basis even. I'll take two more questions, John, so we don't exhaust you, because I know you have class later on. Uh, but I think it's important to take two more. Uh, first, how can we motivate uh, teachers and students at home, but also at the distancing school to share their afflicting emotions or their uh, not so pleasant emotional states. How can we how can we open the space when when it's not uh, when it's when it's not an automatic process or people are not used to? Sure. How can we engage? Uh, sure, yeah. sure. That's an excellent question, and a lot of that depends on the social environment of where they're going to share. So if it's um. If you had a classroom before the pandemic where things were comfortable and kids could share, you know, 30 kids in a classroom and they felt comfortable sharing their feelings. If you had that environment before the class, you could probably recreate it when you're doing the distance learning. Uh, if you didn't have that environment before, it's more challenging. But I think to create the right environment for social sharing or for emotional expression, you have to give the message that it's okay to share emotions 
that we all feel emotions. No one should ever laugh or make fun of someone else for feeling something. That would be very detrimental. So we want to try to create an environment where the message is it's okay to feel what you feel. It's valuable to share. One thing could be self-disclosure. The teacher could share feelings. I was going this, I was doing that. You know, the teacher could feel, share what she or he were, were going through and that sets a stage, it's okay to share. The teacher shared feelings, so maybe I could share feelings. So that's one way in a bigger group. Uh, you may want to have smaller groups. If you could set up smaller uh, you know, uh, Zoom sessions or, or Skype sessions with students, where maybe you could talk in a group of three or four as opposed to a group of 30. So that environment might feel safer and, and, and easier to, to learn. Okay. I think, that, I think that's an excellent advice, especially if you detect there's some students or people you interact with that need that special space. And then yes. fin finally, but not least important, we're going to go back to the outside society. We're coming out at some point and we're going back to the school at some point to rejoin our groups. So any advice, any commentary as to how should we welcome not only our students but ourselves too into this coming back in the society i mean any prospects on emotions on or how to handle the emotional uh suspense but also interactions that are going to follow in this re re, re uh, union and re-encounter yeah. in the outside world Sure, sure, good question. Um, I, I think there'll be a mix of emotions because we're not coming back all at once. It's coming up in stages, little by little. And there's still gonna be fears. There's still gonna be concerns. Uh, you know, I know me personally, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm happy that things are gonna be opening up, but I'm in no rush to be in a big crowd, okay? So I'll still be wearing a mask and keeping social distancing. So here's where we kind of balance two emotions in the same space. Uh, yes, we'll probably be very joyful to be back at work or be back with friends or be back on this, you know, with, with other people, the neighbors. It'll be great to feel it. We'll have a lot of pleasant, positive emotions. And while those are good, again, those are uh, enjoyable emotions, being too happy might not be intelligent because you might forget that you should be a little bit worried or concerned at least and keep a mask and keep a social distance until we can be completely sure that we're over this pandemic. And uh, we don't have a second wave. So here's where, as, as, as you know, enjoyable that happiness might be, if you're too happy and you're hugging and kissing people and getting too close to people, you're putting yourself and them at danger. So I would say modify, have moderate emotions. Don't be on a five on the mood meter, maybe a two or three in terms of joyful emotions so you don't overdo it and forget that you have to be careful. And while you have the... Uh, a concern or a little bit of a worry, a cautiousness, keep those mild emotions in mind so you can be a little more attentive and sharp and make sure to, re to keep the social distancing until it's completely certain that we don't have to. So sort of a mix of emotions and a, and a moderation of emotions. That would be my recommendation. I think it's very interesting what you're saying because in a way we wouldn't say that fear or cautiousness would be uh, negative emotions when it, when it really provide some some sort of safety se sense of safety when dealing with this kind of uh, crisis Absolutely. or situation so it's very interesting it's it maybe for some people counterintuitive but really uh, important to acknowledge and on the other side how happy emotions may not be that intelligent if they're too happy you know if it's leading you to be too close to people it's not so intelligent you want to hold, modify it very interesting. John, I, I want to say again, thank you very much for this time. I, I just want to thank also all the participants. We had about more than 500 people connected today to this webinar. So it's, uh, I think we're all in need and in, in wanting to learn more about how to use our emotions, not only to be better persons, but to know how to better interact in these times of crisis. And of course, in this strange world, of, uh, uh, of uh, distancing and remote learning that took us for surprise. So I thank you again, I thank all the audience. I wanna thank also uh, La Confederación Nacional de Escuelas Particulares, el Departamento de Educación de la Universidad Iberoamericana y por supuesto también al doctor John Pelletieri, 
por acompañarnos el día de hoy en este webinar. No olviden, tenemos eh, la grabación. No que there will be a recording available. La, la, se subirá la, la grabación al sitio web. This is going to be uploaded to the website. De manera que pueden acceder nuevamente a la información que trabajamos so el día de hoy en el, en el webinar. John, thank you very much again. I hope to see you soon. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. So, um, thank you for all the teachers for the great work you're doing with kids. It's very thank important. You. Thank you. Thank you to all the teachers. We're okay. sure that this wouldn't be the same if the teachers weren't continuing with their hard work and their um, good attitude towards keeping up, not, not with schooling, but with creating a sense of group, a sense of continuity, and a sense of humanity. So thank you. Thank you, John. Muchas gracias. Be okay. safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Care. Thank you for being here.